Welcome to the Prepare Like a Pro podcast. Every week, I host live chats via our YouTube channel with leaders in the AFL and high-performance industries. Join me live every Sunday at 6 p.m. where I debrief the recent chats and announce the upcoming guests. We drop an inspiring and educational episode every Monday. If you like the show, please follow us on your favorite podcast app. Welcome back to the Prepare Like a Pro podcast. This week on the show, we have Stefan Moore the founder of the Inner Game Journal. After a decorated junior football career as a National Australian Representative and an Australian Institute of Sports Scholarship holder, Stefan signed his first pro contract in the A-League at 16 years of age. After winning a championship with the Adelaide United in 2015-16, Stefan signed a three-year contract to play in the neck in the Europe uh, leagues. Since returning to Australia, he has played in the Brisbane Raw and currently at Adelaide United again. Before we start episode 58, the Prepare Like a Pro podcast mission is to empower aspiring athletes and staff with practical knowledge from some of the industry's most inspiring individuals and to strengthen the AFL community. If you like the show, please show your support by following us on on Instagram and subscribing to the podcast. We're on iTunes, Spotify and YouTube. Thanks for joining us, guys. Like always, if you've got a question for Stefan, send through your questions by hitting the bottom uh, toggle of your screen. I'm just inviting Stefan to join me now. Bear with me. There he is. Hey, Stefan, how are you? How are you, mate? You good? Yeah, going well. Thanks for jumping on, mate. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me. We'll, we'll dive straight in, mate. Take us back to the beginning. Uh, what age did you start playing soccer and, and uh, when did you recognize you had a, a talent for the game and, and wanted to take it to the top level? I, I started playing when I was probably four or five years old. Um, that's when I first got into it. Um, I have a, a German background, so I guess my dad was um, was big big on, on soccer, football, um, but I played a range of different sports when I was younger in uh, AFL, cricket, tennis, and I actually played club AFL until I was 10 years old, and that's when I made the change to uh, to soccer. Uh, my dad was the one that kind of forced me into that and just said, if you want to become a professional in that, you really need to start to learn the, the skills, which are a lot more, um, a lot harder to learn, I think, compared to other sports, um, and it turned out to be a, a pretty pretty good decision by him. Yeah, absolutely. And so when you made that decision, you mentioned you were playing a few other sports. Did you drop all of them for soccer at the age of ten? Uh, I still played. I still played tennis a little bit and cricket until until cricket got to where it was going to take up my whole day. Um, then I decided to get rid of that. Uh, and then yep. probably about twelve was when I stopped playing all other sports. And it was just soccer in winter, and then in the summer I'd play indoor soccer um, or just be be with friends going to have a kick. But that was when I uh, probably started yeah taking it a little bit more serious and probably the age where you do need to start to narrow down what you're doing and, and the amount of hours you're training need to be a specific sport, I'd say. Yeah, I, I mean, AFL seems to be following to a similar fashion to, to soccer, but soccer's certainly um, way more advanced in, in the sense that you have to start pretty early and be a specialist early, don't you? Like, a, was was the, you know, 12-year-old self, was that the common age that Australians start to um, focus on specialising in the game of soccer or is it even younger? I would definitely say younger i think it's um it's one of those sports where um yeah you do have to learn a lot and the the technique um is something that you know you you work on hours on end and, and you look at you know over in in europe and south america and um and places like that they have academies for their top tier teams from under eight um so they're training wow. three four times a week in a in an elite setup and um, where we're not able to have that here in Australia uh, in that top tier setup, obviously, because it costs a lot of money. But I think that will be the, I'm sure that would be the end goal for a lot of um, a lot of clubs here. And, and you look at Melbourne City and Western United, I think Victory um, and a few of the other Sydney teams, they've got academies now from the age of under 12s and 13s. And you know, you, then you can actually start to develop those players the way you want them to play. And um, you know you're going to get quality coaching. Yeah, and, and you were picked up at, um, well, I guess from my point of view, definitely seems a young age, like 16 to get your first contract. Is that quite common in Australia to get in the soccer world, to get a um, 
a contract or was that quite uh, that was earlier than um, you sort of planned? Prob- oh, it wasn't earlier than I planned. I always uh, I always thought I was going to get one at a young age, but the reality is I don't think it happens for many people. I think um, going to the Institute of Sport at uh, at 15 was probably a, a big breakthrough and going to that elite setup where I did start to train uh, and also just be surrounded by other professional athletes from different sports. And you've got, you know, your nutritionist, your sports psychologist, your recovery centers there. So you start to learn a little bit more that, you know, yes, you can be a good player, but there's a whole lot more that comes into uh, to being a professional and, and being exposed to that. I, I, you know, kind of made a promise to myself that, you know, if I, you know, as long as I give 100% and, and don't um, slacken off, then if I don't make it, then that's fine because I know I gave it everything um, and, and I really wanted to make sure I, I utilised all of those different um, opportunities we had available to us at the Institute of Sport. Was it overwhelming at the age of 15 to have, uh, I guess, take it so seriously at that age and, and, and focus on your lifestyle and really live the professional? Um, it sounds like you're living the, living it at that age of 15, yeah. is it, you know, um, or or is it just something you embraced and, and uh, always wanted? I, I think um, to answer, I guess, the question that you had at the start, when did you first think you were going to, could make it professionally? Didn't answer that one, but that was the time when I really did think, okay, well, I always believed in myself, but this was like, okay, now you've been selected in the top top 10, 12 players in your age group. Um, and when we got there, we got told that probably 25 to 30% of the people that have a scholarship at the Institute get a contract. So, you know, it's not very many people um, getting in, out of the Institute get a contract straight away. So I, I made a promise, like I said to myself, to be very professional because I thought, well, if I'm here, I'm sacrificing being with my, being away from friends and missing out on missing out on so much uh, mm. I wanted to make sure that I gave it everything and and some players probably couldn't do that but I just felt like well if this is what it takes to be a professional athlete then this is this is what you have to um, sacrifice and how did what did that look like from from an actions point of view were you hanging around meetings but like for, for those eager athletes that are listening in and and wanting to adopt that same mindset how did you apply it was it um, seeking, you know, obviously you've, you're surrounded in the right environment, but how did you make the most of that environment? Yeah, so I think it was just going to speak to those people, the nutritionist, the sports psychologist, um, and actually asking for information on um, on what to do to get better and then taking that on board because it's very easy now, I think, with so many different platforms that give you the information, but then, you know, you need to go and do it every day. You know, we got told what was the right thing to eat and what was not the right thing to eat. And we're in a dining hall there where it's a buffet. So you could just as easily go and have four plates of uh, whatever it was uh, being served that night, have ice cream afterwards and enjoy yourself. Um, but that wasn't going to help me. So I was actually taking taking on board what they said and sticking to it. And, and a big thing that one of um, the next basketballer, his name wasn't, uh, sorry, he wasn't. And he said the best form of recovery is your head on the pillow. And it was a basic message that he said. But ever since he said that, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to start going to bed at nine o'clock and I'll wake up at six o'clock. You know, that's getting a good amount of sleep. That's nine hours. They say eight to 10. I think that nine hours is a good point. And I used to get teased um, for going to bed so early and I still do it now. It's it's my routine. It's something that's set set in stone really for me. And people mm. still, you know, take take the piss out of me. But that was one of those things where I was like, well, I need to actually put things in place um, to make sure that, you know, I'm not just talking about it. I'm actually... Um, I'm actually doing it and, and I found like that benefited me then when I was on the field I could be more confident because I knew I was doing more off the field than the people um, s- surrounding me I guess. Yeah I love that it's such a great message like it's all good and well especially in this day and age information's everywhere like you said um, but it probably comes down to the, the differentiator is, is applying it and applying it like you said in a routine so you're getting consistency. At what point when you when you're applying these new things to your craft and your lifestyle and um and the way you're preparing yourself when you're trying a new thing how long do you um how much time do you give it to to where it's going to be set in stone as part of your routine and then how do you what's your main measure of yep this is helping me is it how you're feeling is it is there is there a bit of data involved is it mentors yeah. that give you feedback yeah. is it you know what's your how do you adopt uh, the think, things that you love yeah that's a good that's a good question and it's something that i think is uh, constantly evolving. I'm always looking out for 
an article that comes out about a, another player, whether it's an AFL player, whether it's an NBA player, an English Premier League player, and um, they say they're trying something out, then I'll be like, oh, that sounds pretty good. I might give that a go if they're maybe meditating just before they go out for a game or they're, um, I think it was Christian Petrarca I read, um, was reading a book just before he went out in the change rooms, and I thought, oh, that's actually not a bad idea. The book's obviously going to get you in a good mind space, so I'll, I'll maybe trial it out once. Um, and if I feel good doing it, then I'll continue on with it. And if it doesn't work, then if I have a bad game, I obviously can't blame it completely on something like that. But I'd be like, well, maybe that didn't work for me. And I think it's more of a feeling that I get from it um, because you can have yeah. a poor performance. But it's more about well, how, do, how did that make me feel? Did that get me in the right mindset? Um, I go I go on the beach every morning at, um, at 6.30. And yes, the cold therapy, let's say, is good for you. But for me, it's more so... I. You know, it's not always comfortable to go, especially when it's terrible weather like it is here in Adelaide right now. But by me doing mm. that, it's a challenging thing to do. And when I get out of the water, I feel really good about myself. And it's the best the best way for me to start off my day. And I think, um, you know, finding those small things that work for you individually are the most important. And that's where you can trial and um, and see what works. Um, ideally, probably not around the game day. Do it in a training session, do it in a midweek, in an off-season, and um, and you're always constantly looking for ways to get better and, and things that can improve you as a player, and nobody nobody really ever stops learning, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. How important is that curiosity for someone that wants to be a professional athlete? Yeah, it's. I think for anyone that is a professional athlete, they must have been curious to understand um, what other players are doing, what coaches are telling them, what the best players in the world in their sport are doing, because you... You know, you don't know the information unless you go out there and kind of look for it. Um, maybe you get really fortunate and you get surrounded by a good coach or a mentor. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, you still have to ask the questions and when they speak, you actually have to listen. So I think I think now with technology and social media, all the answers like we spoke about are out there. So being curious is a uh, is a big thing. And if you can look out for, for ways to get better, that's great. And then it's just about implementing them because it's, it's very easy to um, – to put a post up saying that you're working hard, um, but you're not working hard. So it's then really implementing implementing that stuff, which is the hardest thing for any athlete to do because it's not easy to be to be switched on 24/7 and um, not having that glass of coke or or not staying out late with your mate, um, but actually sacrificing something today that's going to improve you tomorrow. Something that seems to be a common trend from from when you were younger to, to even now when you mentioned Christian Petrarca, but the basketball player um, when you were 15. So it's, it sounds like obviously you learn off soccer players, football players, but um, you seem to look um, more abroad as well at other sports. Um, has that come naturally to you? Did someone tell you, you know, uh, was it in the AIS where you're exposed to all different sports where that started or um, or is it just something that ha- has happened naturally? I think um, I've been interested. I mean, I'm quite interested in all different sports. I always watch um, uh, whatever sports on TV. I'm happy to watch because I think if you are watching the best, the best athletes in the world, they're um, you know they're going to be able to, I guess, show you something that you can use in your sport. And um, by reading articles of different players, I think the same thing. You know, what's what works for an AFL player or works for an NBA player or probably works for a football player as well. Maybe you have to change it and alter it a little bit for you, but you can learn you can learn from all different sports and i think um just having that you know that that mindset of always wanting to get better um is probably the most important thing and and that's uh that's what i love i, I love seeing different athletes and um i'm i'm a big footy fan so you know you see Christian Petrarca do really well last season and you think well what is he saying now because obviously he's he's saying this stuff that's helped him but he's obviously backing it up as well um on the on the field and um and that's where I like to, you know, listen and, and read different articles from players about what they what they're eating, what they found it's worked well for them to improve their their game on the field and off the field. And it's um, it's like I said, it's a constantly evolving thing. And I'm not going to do everything, but if I can take one percent from from someone else, I think that's uh, it's only going to improve my game. Absolutely. And um, going to mentors now, you, you mentioned your dad was a strong influence. Um, are there other other people that spring to mind that have helped? shape your, your soccer career yeah definitely i think um probably uh tim schleiger who who's in melbourne um i think you had him on here maybe a couple of weeks ago i think it was um possibly yeah. or maybe he's about about to go on he was someone that i 
I got put on to through my agent, Vince Grella, um, and he got me to go and see Tim at the age of uh, 17. It was after my first season at Melbourne Heart. And not knowing, obviously, who he was or, or whatever, um, I just rocked up and got probably the the hardest massage of my life and was squirm, <laughs> squirming all over the bed. Um, but that, that, again, it opened my eyes to see, okay, so this is maybe what a massage is meant to feel like. And you felt pretty bad. Uh, sorry, you felt good afterwards. A couple hours later, oh, now I feel pretty sore. Um, but the next day I was like, well, my body feels pretty good now. You go back the next week and, and someone that I didn't know was going to turn into a massive mentor on the field, but also off the field. Um, but he's just taught me so much about being a professional because in a, in a club setting, obviously you've got your strength and conditioning, you've got your physios, but they're looking after 23 players in an A-league team. In AFL, it's 40, 50 players. They can't look after every single player's individual needs and, and having someone outside that is just worrying about your needs and what's best for you. Um, that was a really important thing for me. And, and then I knew uh, when I went to the club, there were certain exercises I would do that were important to me. Um, and, and I felt that if I, if I could do, um, these one percenters nobody else was doing, then it was going to improve me. Um, like I said about everything else. Um, but yeah, he, he's been a massive one for me. And, um, yeah, very, very thankful for meeting him that first time. Yeah, it's actually a great topic. Um, uh, yeah, Tim mentioned you as well when I interviewed him. He, he popped up at some point. I can't remember the context. It, it might have been around mindset or, um, but, uh, yeah, the, the individualization and, and, um, specifically in Australia, it seems to be, we're a little bit different with the professional athletes in the private sector. And, um, but you've been onto it at a younger age and your agent sort of got you onto that. But in America and I imagine in Europe, it, it is quite common to seek your own team of support outside of the club. Um, you mentioned it's been really helpful for you. How did you juggle that? Um, I guess in Australian culture, it, was it quite challenging to bring in exercises that you were doing from Tim's programming that was different to what Adelaide or Brisbane Royal were, were recommending? How did you approach that? Yeah, that, that was a tough uh, thing when you're a young player, when you started doing something that you weren't doing before and they hadn't told you to. They do start to ask questions and um and Tim, I guess Tim kind of said to me, you know, if someone's, um, I guess, not sure of themselves and, and you're getting outside help, they're not going to like it. But if they are very confident and they're happy with you doing that, it obviously shows that they, they, they believe in themselves and they're happy to, to let me go and do that. So it was finding what, um, what physios were, were okay with it and what ones weren't and then playing the game a little bit and, and just not telling them. Um, and that's not an ideal yeah. way to be, but yeah, you have to be smart about it because if, if I if I get an injury then and they know I'm being seeing someone else straight away they can put the blame on them and whether mm. that's the case or not as a young player and you're trying to make your way you don't want to be giving a coach or any um, physios or strength and conditioning a reason not to like you um, so it's trying to do it in a way that hopefully they will they will like um, but if not then you you have to be smart about it and um, the older I've got now I know what works for my body so I can tell the strength and conditioning coach okay, this is the program you have for, for everyone, but I know what works for me. And um, we're lucky at Adelaide, they're quite good with that. They're, they're very accommodating um, because, I, you know, I've obviously been in control of my body as a professional for seven, eight years, so I know what works. And um, mm -hmm. as long as I'm doing everything right, then they're happy for me to do my own thing. But as a young player, it's, uh, yeah, you have to you have to be careful because you don't want to rub them off the wrong way. And um, I, I learned a hard way when I was at... Uh, at Melbourne City when the, the physio saw that I was getting some acupuncture and obviously there was no hiding it because there was a little bit of a mark there and he wasn't, he wasn't too happy. But, you know, you, you, learn, you learn from these experiences. Yeah, absolutely do. We'll be right back after this short break to explain our Prepare Like a Pro Academy. Our academy is a subscription-based platform where you can sign up to be a part of our community. If you get to the end of each episode of the podcast and are hungry for more, this is for you. Designed for aspiring AFL athletes and staff, you'll receive heaps of bonus weekly content. Learn who the guests are in advance and submit questions. Access to our Facebook group with Jack and other Prepare Like a Pro coaches. You'll be able to receive merchandise, program discounts and freebies and get free access to our live events, exercise technique database and much more. This is a great way for you to support the podcast and it helps me with production and release of epic content for you guys each week. 
Your contribution goes a long way in making the Prepare Like a Pro community possible. And just for $5 a week, you'll have access to all of this special content released on our Academy forums. There's no lock-in and you can cancel absolutely any time. Welcome back to the show. Were there other players doing the same thing at Melbourne City when you were uh, younger? And then how is that, and if there wasn't, um, how has that changed over the last sort of seven, eight years? Um, yeah, there wasn't too many. There was a couple, um, there's a couple now that go and see Tim through probably that are, you know, with the same agent. But mm -hmm. I think in, in, in football here in Australia, a lot of them don't. Um, I just think, you know, whether it's a money thing, whether it's they don't know who's best to see, they maybe just trust the people at the club. And that's not to say the people at the club aren't good, but like I said, they're worrying about 23 other people and not just you specifically. So I think in the off season is the best time to go and do it and figure out a program that works for you and then try and take that into the season. And when you come back, you actually can, um, can still continue on with that. And if they can see you've improved in your strength and your speed, they're going to probably start asking, well, what, what have you been doing? Because it's obviously worked. Mm. And and take us through how how would you manage that from a workload point of view? So if you saw a team in the off season, you had your off season programming. Um, did they sort of blend into like would Tim look at your program and just blend in your loading with the gym and the field within the the nuts and bolts of the of the uh, club's program? Is that how it worked? Yeah, like I guess we would get our club program, which would obviously have some running, um, obviously a cardio aspect, whether it was running, whether it was a bit of bike. Um, and then you'd have your gym, um, your gym stuff as well. And all of the gym stuff for Tim's. And, yep. um, I would probably try and add in, to be honest, whatever they would give us in the off season, it was the bare minimum. I always like to do a little bit more anyway. So I'll just do, um, do the sessions with Tim and, and then do theirs as well. Um, as long as, or if I knew I had a hard session with Tim, then I didn't have to worry about the club stuff because I knew I was getting, getting enough done. And then when you go into pre-season and then even more so season, um, how did you, how often would you see team? I'm not, not as much as off season, I imagine. No. So I guess once the season started, uh, when I was in Melbourne, I tried to see Tim, um, every couple of weeks, maybe every fortnight, or if I was struggling, um, with an injury, then I'd probably see him a little bit more regularly. Obviously, when I'm in Adelaide or when I've been in Brisbane, it's um, it's very hard to get down. So if we play an away game, I may stay an extra day just to go and see him just because I know uh, he knows my body really well. Um, and from that one one chat with him, that one assessment, he may say, OK, this is what you're lacking. You really need to focus on this, um, you know, strengthen your glutes back up. Small, uh, small little tweaks that he can do for me to work on myself. Um, mm. and, and that can then help me get through for the rest of the season. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 um. Thanks for sharing that and 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 being um yeah, open and honest with with what's worked for you and and the approach you're going because I, I do believe it's sort of where we're going now in Australia, not just soccer but AFL as well. With since the COVID cuts, it's even got like you said, individualization is a lot harder. Um, and it's not like the SNCs or physios are um, they're just up against it. Uh, and I've witnessed yeah. it as well. And it is it is hard to individualize um, where. Well, like I mentioned, the private sector, there can be where they can work together and complement each other. And um, if it's coming from a place where everyone's just trying to help the athlete be the best they can be, then, like you said, it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, ex exactly. I think that's that's the most important thing, that if, you know, the common goal for everyone is to improve and to get better, then I don't think it should be a problem. It's only really an issue if you're going to see someone that isn't very knowledgeable um, and maybe they're going to get you injured from being overloaded. So I, I think there's a... There's a balance, but you have to you have to trust the person you're going to see, and you have to you have to know what your body can handle as well. And it helps to have references, isn't it? Like your agent um, referred you on, that builds that trust. And then, obviously, that first session with you, you felt um, you were talking about the importance of feeling when you're trying new things out and listening to your intuition. Uh, it sounds like you, you trusted your gut on that as well. So the agent reference, and then you tried it, felt good in the off season as well, where it's low risk. Um, and then it's something that you've, you've stuck with for the rest of your career, which is, um, great to hear, mate. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. Um, we'll, we'll move into the inner journal now, mate. Um, talk us about it. What made you, um, create the inner game journal? Yeah, I guess, um, pretty much touching on everything I guess I've always spoken about. I think that I've always looked for ways to, um, 
to get better and improve myself and whether it's my nutrition, whether it's, you know, ice baths, whether it's reading a certain book, visualization, all of those sort of things. Um, and, and the one thing I probably have lacked is, uh, you know, is to be confident and to believe in myself and, um, my mind, you know, my, my best performance was, was so, so good. And my worst performance was not great. And it was, uh, I guess a frustrating thing to not know why, why I wasn't performing in a certain way. And, um, and throughout the years, I, you know, I'd, I'd started to read different books and go and see different people and listen to podcasts and, and just try and understand, well, what do, what do the best people do? And, and I was always searching for this secret, I guess, you know, whether it was just one thing that I was going to find that was just going to make me be the best. And mm. I came to the, <laughs> The final answer that there is no one thing um, there's no secret out there that it's it's not just a magic potion that you take and all of a sudden you're going to be the best every single day but it's accumulating all those little messages and those little learnings that you've figured out and implementing them all and the mindset was a big thing so you know I started I started writing things down when I was I think at Melbourne City when I was 17 18 I'd do a vision board and I would write um, write my goals, my short term, long term, medium. And then I started writing goals for the session. And I felt like that was good. But a lot of those goals were, um, around, you know, the outcome, um, rather than the process. And at that time, you know, with my personality, I was trying to be a perfectionist. So if things didn't go well, so harsh on myself, it was kind of, um, counterintuitive where I'd be so down on myself because I missed two passes, but I wouldn't know or I wouldn't have realized that I actually made. 60 good passes in the session I was focusing on the negatives so mm. it was um it was kind of a journey along the way and and then reading another book um called the winner's bible kind of got me to create my own winner's bible figuring out what I guess uh an elite athlete or what what the what the traits were for me to be my best and um and during during COVID I had the time and um I kind of combined all these different journals whether it was you know gratitude journals um some sports um sports review stuff after a session rating yourself then writing goals out scheduling and kind of just combined it all and thought well this is this is what I think I want um as an athlete and if I want this then maybe there's a lot a lot of others that are out there and and it was probably the one part of the game that we don't focus on enough is um is understanding yourself. If you can understand yourself, what I've spoken about, know what you need by mm. starting to track yourself and um, your daily trainings and your games, you should now know what your best performance looks like and what your worst performance looks like and what's the feeling that you get out in the best ones. What did you do really well in the best ones? Um, and then really focus on uh, focus on aiming for that every day. So I have the same three goals every single day. Um, and that's to be, you know, to be aggressive, to face forward and play forward. So to be positive and let's say in a game to get into the box. So it's not about scoring goals. It's not about doing an assist. It's not about making a tackle, but it's actually, if I focus on those three things, um, then I'm giving myself a really good chance to, uh, to play at my best. Yeah. That's, um, yeah, it's been, it's amazing that you've just started. So last year, was it during COVID lockdown, you, you brought it all to life in the game journal? Yeah. Yeah, so I kind of um, awesome, mate. Congratulations! Yeah, I, just thought, I just thought, why not? It's uh, it was something that was I was looking for something. Um, sorry, I'm just chucking my phone on charge so it doesn't die on us. Um, yeah. So I was I was looking for something myself during COVID, and and I was going on all these different web to try and um, try and find something, try and find something that could I could create myself, and um, then I realised that there was just nothing there, so I created i guess i just created created my own and went on that journey of um figuring out how that would work work best um and here we are today yeah and, and you, you mentioned uh the, the journey so it sounds like you've worked a lot on um the inner game you talk about the mindset and, and how powerful it is in terms of consistency of performance um, bridging that gap from your worst to, to to your best games and, and getting closer to repeating those best games more often um, you seem someone that's really self-aware from this chat that we've had. You, you, you know, when you're, you know, if you're overanalyzing something, or you, like you mentioned, perfectionism and the issues that that can come with that. Um, how do you work on awareness? Is there, is it uh, journaling things down? Uh, how have you worked on that sort of skill? Yeah, I, I think getting an inner game journal is a great start to it. Um, but yep. no, it's it's 
I, I think it really is just spending time and actually thinking about what works best for you, what hasn't worked best for you. And, and using a journal, it doesn't have to be the inner game journal. It could be just a blank journal, really, but actually spending time to think about, you know, how the session went, what went well, what didn't go well, how, how were you feeling before you went into the session, for example? Did you feel nervous before you went in? Did you feel confident? Uh, because something so small like that can then affect your, can affect your performance, obviously. So if you are now more mindful when you're going out there to the session, you can start to think, okay, so I, I'm, I'm feeling nervous right now. I need to start, you know, saying positive things to myself or I need to focus on these goals to get myself in a good mindset for the session. Um, mm. and, and along, along the way, you know, you learn I'm, I'm far from being perfect. You know, the, the, the best players in the world would be the exact same. It's just, you know, you're constantly trying to get better every day. And, um, by being aware of yourself, that's, that's the first step. And then you should hopefully put things in place to, um, to improve your performance. Doesn't mean you're always going to play well, but if, at least when you don't play well, you should know what, what didn't work well. So instead of just being upset and losing confidence, you're now almost excited. Well, you know, something didn't go well today, but I can work on that tomorrow to get better at it. And I think that's the most important thing for an athlete is to, um, to always try and get better, not worry so much about the end result because a lot of the times we can't control the end result. But what you can mm. control is um, is your preparation and your mindset and um, and what you're trying to achieve, I guess. Yeah, like you said earlier, um, shifting your mindset from focusing only on the outcome and trying to focus more your energy on the, on the process. I love that. Um, mentioned that earlier. That, and also the, the three areas that you focus on um, how did you come to those three areas and, and, uh, and was that through speaking with a coach? Was that through journaling? You recognize that those were when you do those three things really well in training and in games that they're, they're your big three. They're like your big three rocks, so to speak. Talk us through yeah. that, how you find those three. Yeah. So I guess I kind of just broke it down, um, from working on, all right, well, how, what does my best game look like? Um, and how, how am I playing? What am I doing? Um, and then being like, okay, so this is, this is my best game. This is my ideal game. And then from there, I then said, okay, so what are the main things that I'm doing? How do I actually need to, to feel when it's not about making 30 passes at 95% completion, but it's okay. So I need to be aggressive. So whether that's in a tackle, whether that's with the ball, um, and then, you know, facing forward, playing forward, that's a positive thing for me to do rather than being nervous to, to turn I'll, instead of going backwards I want to go forwards every time and getting into the box you know I put a lot of emphasis when I was younger on scoring and sometimes I couldn't control that if the cross wasn't good if the the the, the, the ball bobbled just before it got to me the goalkeeper had a really good game you know but I my um my value and my game let's say was determined if I scored goals or not but sometimes mm. I couldn't control that. So all of a sudden I was really upset after games, even though I played a good game. So now it's okay. Well, I, I need to be in the, I need to be in the box to score and I need to yep. shoot, but the outcome is irrelevant. Um, because as long as I'm doing those couple things, I will score goals. There's, there's no doubt about that. And if I focus on those, I'm never going to lose confidence. I'll get angry at myself if I don't get in the box for a cross. And that's something that I look at at the end of the game. How many crosses did I not get in there for? Okay. So next game, you have to make sure you get in there for those. And, and that's what I can control. And it means my confidence doesn't dip. doesn't mean that I, I don't get upset when I don't score, of course. Um, but it's it's trying to refocus on, well, what, what can I control? Yeah, that's great. There, there are three different, um, you know, types of focuses as well, which is really uh, helpful, I imagine, for athletes listening down, like from a mindset point of view, staying positive and, um, and then a positional one as well, like op creating opportunities, um, which is, which is great, man. That's uh, a good insight. Uh, and, uh, and no doubt athletes listening in. Uh, I also think for coaches, the inner game journal, um, thanks for, for passing one on to me as well, mate, but I've, I've been using it, um, with coaching sessions and, and, uh, I think it's really applicable for whether you be fitness coaches, physios or, or skill coaches to apply it as well, uh, in preparation to, be the best fit for the athletes or clients that you're working with. So, um, yeah, mate, definitely recommend those listening in. Make sure you get your hands on the Inner Game Journal. Where's the best place to, to find it? Uh, place would, um, on the Instagram, you can go on the Instagram and go straight to the website or if you want to go straight to the website, www.theinnergamejournals.com. Be, that would be the best place. And, and like you said, I definitely think, um, 
you know, for, for an athlete, for a coach, um, a match official, or even just someone looking to be, be the best they can in whatever field. I think, um, yeah, I think the journal suits perfectly for them. And, um, that's why I've tried to make it, uh, open that any athlete can use it. And with the left column of the review, um, is left blank for your individual needs. Um, but everything besides that is relative to a to the everyday person, not just uh, not just an athlete. And it's important, I think, for people, yeah, to start to understand themselves a lot more, so you can actually work on things to improve on. Yeah, fantastic, mate. We'll we'll start to wrap it up. What what are you excited about for for 2021, mate? What's on the horizon that's got you up and about at the moment? Yeah, well, we're um we obviously just lost on the weekend in a semi final, uh, which was disappointing, but. I'm excited to, uh, I guess with the young squad that we've got for going in for the preseason, I think we can, we can improve a lot. And, and for me being the, the captain, I'm excited to, um, to hopefully be able to influence the young players a lot more and to, um, to push them to, to be, I guess, the best they can be. Um, and I think, you know, for me off the field, um, just growing, growing the business and understanding that, um, our players union was really big on us doing stuff outside of football. Because it improves your performance, and I've noticed a massive change in that. Um, so I'm really excited to grow the journal and to hopefully, I guess, spread the message to as many as many kids and other professional athletes as as I can. And going out and speaking to schools or to to academies and stuff has been a you know a really exciting thing. And going to the journal, my purpose when I was younger was to be a professional footballer. Um, where now, you know, I realise you know you can't define yourself as a footballer. I'm a person first. Um, and mm-hmm. now my purpose is to help inspire, um, people to be the best they can be. So it's, yeah, it's really exciting to be able to spread, spread that message and, um, and hopefully influence, influence other people not to be professional athletes, um, but just to try and be the best they can be personally. Yeah. And there's no better time than now for, to have people like yourself with that focus. So thank you very much, mate, for jumping on and, and sharing, um, it, yeah, being, all the, the wisdom that you have with us and, and experiences the work, you know, the good, the bad. Um, yeah, appreciate your honesty and, yeah, thanks again for your time. No worries. Thanks very much. Good time. I think my phone's just about to die as well. So, Awesome. We, we snuck no it in. Beautiful. Perfect. No worries. <laughs> awesome. Thanks Devon. very much. If you enjoyed this episode and want even more, our academy is for you. The Prepare Like a Pro Academy is a platform that hosts exclusive features and bonus content such a Q&A segment aimed at getting to know the guests on a more personal level. Here's an example with Emily Meehan, head sports dietitian at the Collingwood Football Club. What are things that, that fire you up? Oh, this one is always, uh, so I suppose it is, um, it'll be topical for most people, I think, but staying in your lane. And I yep. often find that with nutrition, everyone eats, so everyone has an opinion. And I think that's what really gets me fired up um, because so many people try and provide nutrition advice based on their end of one experience when they did intermittent fasting or keto or whatever it might be. And then game changes, sure yeah, game game changes whatever that might be. And look, it probably keeps me in a job, but that it does drive me insane because yeah. sometimes the information can be so detrimental um, and opposite to what I've been working with my athlete or athletes and, you know, and because they hear it on someone's socials or through a documentary, it unravels everything that I've been working with an athlete for. Yeah, yeah. Another feature of our academy is the opportunity each week to join myself as co-host on the Prepare Like a Pro live chat show. Here's an example with Academy member Rama Davies, the strength and conditioning coach at the Box Hill Hawks. Welcome, Rama, to the chat. Uh, Rama has also worked at, at Box Hill, or currently he's working at Box Hill Hawks with us. Awesome. So he's another Box Hill man uh, in the strength and conditioning department. So I'll handle it over to you, Rama, to, to ask you a question, mate. Thanks for joining us. Excellent. Thanks, Jack. And yeah, thanks, um, thanks Sam, for the chat. It was uh, I found it to be really insightful. Plenty of gems in there. Um, and I enjoyed it a lot. Um, mate, my, my question to you was you spoke a, a, quite a bit about um, perspective during that chat, um, and I was wondering what are some of the things that you either know or um, do physically that um, you wish you either knew or did 
um, back at the beginning of your career? Uh, what are some of those things? Mm, yeah, good question. Um, yeah, so I suppose with perspective on life, um, that sort of point, um, it, yeah, certainly, yeah, has been massive for me now and, and didn't probably have that as much um, when I was younger. Um, I suppose one thing I might mention is, is gratitude. I spend a lot of my time um, doing a lot of gratitude exercises, listening to podcasts, doing a, a journal every day just to, be, to say what I'm grateful for, sort of three things. And um, that's a fantastic way that I've been able to, yeah, like reset and, and just kind of gain that gratitude and perspective about, you know, that there is more to life than football or, you know, it might be whatever, as an S&C coach, you know, if something's you're having a hard time, um, it can be massive with just, yeah, opening your eyes a little bit and losing that sort of tunnel vision or being stuck in that, in that work bubble. Um, yeah. So that's, that's been huge. Um, I think I wish back then when I was younger, I asked more questions and was a bit more open to different things. Mm -hmm. I think I was a bit single minded back then. And, um, you know, I thought there was one way of doing things. And, um, if I kind of didn't have that fear, fear of, you know, asking a silly question or fear of judgment, it would have got me a lot further and I probably would have learned a lot quicker. Um, and yeah. and yeah, like just, yeah, being open to sort of different things. Um, cause you never know what you might find. It's just, yeah, there's so many people like great people out there, knowledgeable people to learn off. And there's plenty more where that came from. If you would like to learn more, then enter patreon.com forward slash prepare like a pro or head to the link in our show notes. Thank you for listening to the prepare like a pro podcast. If you like this episode, it'd be a massive help. If you could like follow rate, give a review or even share with your mates. The show is recorded in Melbourne, Australia. Be sure to follow our Instagram page for all updates on our latest and greatest. If you would like to get in touch to suggest a guest or advertise with the Prepare Like a Pro podcast, please email me at jack at preparelikeapro.com. Thanks so much for tuning in.